Welcome to our webinar, everyone. We'll just give it a minute and wait for everyone to, to come in and join us and then we'll, we'll get started with some intros. All right, we might have a few more people coming in, um, but before we get started today, I just wanted to run through some quick housekeeping for those of you that might not have been on one of our webinars before. Um, firstly, welcome. Um, today, we're going to be talking about ethical and ESG investing. I've got a special guest with me here um, to present today that I will introduce in just a moment. But in terms of how the webinar will run, um, we've got a chat box available throughout the webinar. Please feel free to jump in there. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and if you have any comments throughout the webinar, feel free to put them in the chat. If you do have any specific questions while we're going through the content, we will have time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so we've actually got a little Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And if you can just use that Q&A function rather than the chat for any specific questions, that will help us to answer those at the end. Um, I'll just go to the next slide and we've got a quick disclaimer here. So Superhero does not provide financial advice that considers your personal objectives, financial situation or particular needs and all investments carry risks. So please consider carefully before investing. We will be going through some charts today. So just keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance and that any graphics, charts and graphs you see today are provided for illustrative purposes only. So. I would like to introduce my guest here today. We have Dean, um, and Dean is joining us from Pangana. Um, I'll let Dean come on and introduce himself um, and let you know a little bit more about Pangana, um, and then he'll be running us through the content today. Um, I'll be online answering some of your questions, and then we'll pop back on um, for the Q&A at the end. Welcome, Dean. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all today. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Dean Weinbrunn. I'm a member of the team and executive director here at Pingvana Capital Group. Uh, we're a diversified investment manager. We have a range of different investment products available to Australian retail investors. Um, I'm obviously not here to get into the whole sales pitchy thing, but uh, you know that's not the purpose of the webinar today. If you want to know more, it's best to check us out at pingvana.com. Uh, we've, we've got some pretty cool investment products available. So. Let's, let's get into the content for the webinar today. Um, obviously, the topic for today's webinar is ethical and ESG investing. But with such growing interest in this fairly new space, I think it's important for investors to understand the full spectrum of responsible investing so that you can understand where it is that your specific ethics fit and then make informed decisions on how to allocate your savings. So let's start by taking a step back for a moment and look at a broader defined concept of responsible investing. As you can see on screen, Wikipedia defines responsible investing as any investment strategy which seeks to consider both financial return and social or environmental good to bring about positive change. The rise of responsible investing can be attributed to a growing understanding that there's more that drives investment returns than just company financials. And companies that ignore significant environmental, social or governance issues can't and won't thrive over the long term. So how does this concept of responsible investing fit into traditional investing and, and what does it actually mean? Sorry, I've skipped ahead. First, let's start with one way that you can look at investing in shares. Shareholders are owners in a company. It's that simple. If you own 100% of the shares in a business, you are the owner of that business. But it's no different if you own 5% of the shares or even 0.5%. If you own shares in a company, you are an owner of that company. So that begs the question, what kind of company do you want to be an owner of? If, for example, uh, your best mate came to you later this afternoon and said that they wanted to start a business and they wanted to get you involved or they wanted to get you invested, Naturally, the first question you would ask is, okay, what kind of business is it? And then they go on to tell you that it's a tobacco business. Some of you may like the idea, some of you may not. 
But let's say perhaps their business idea is an animal testing laboratory. How do you feel about that now? Or maybe the side hustle is in human trafficking. Are you still keen to invest? If your answer to all three of those scenarios was an immediate yes, maybe this webinar isn't for you. But if you would hesitate to put your name and money to any one of those ideas, that effectively is a form of responsible ownership. And that's just the point. Some people may have said yes to one thing, but not the other. While some of you may have been completely against investing in all three business ideas. We all have different ethics and moral compasses, and that may determine where we each choose to invest our money. Consideration of where and what you put your resources to and the social and environmental impact you make on this world with those resources, that is responsible investing. Okay, so let's take a look at the different types or styles of responsible investing, what they mean and how they may apply to you. We've always had the two outside columns, traditional investments and philanthropic investments. The concept of responsible investing all started around back in the 90s when some investors started to exclude companies and industries that were considered destructive or harmful to people and or the planet. Over time, these exclusion filters were extended as the concept grew. And today, we generally accept that about 20% of the listed equity markets or companies listed on the world stock exchanges are excluded from an authentic ethical fund once these filters are accounted for. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this slide. And by the time I'm done, hopefully you'll be better versed in the different types of responsible investing, which will help you make more informed decisions on how you want to allocate your own money. There's primarily three distinct categories to this idea of responsible investing. The first and probably most commonly quoted category is ESG. It's even in the, the, the header for today's webinar. The letters ESG, for those of you that don't know and are completely new to this, stand for environmental, social, and governance. And really what it entails is looking at each of these non-financial company characteristics through the policies that a company has in place. What are its environmental policies? What are its social policies? And what are its governance policies? If we go back to traditional investments on the left-hand side of the slide, this way of investing is only concerned with looking at financial metrics. When we incorporate this concept of ESG into how we assess companies, we now bring these non-financial metrics for example, um, under the environmental filter is something like carbon policies. You can actually measure it. This company has a footprint of X. From an inve investment perspective, in any transitional economy, a company with a high carbon footprint is probably not well positioned. So it's likely to be impacted in future by any transition away from fossil fuels which for you may be a red flag when considering where to put your hard-earned money. It's an extra filter, an extra piece of data or information to help you make a decision. It's important to note, and it's a common misconception, that simply incorporating ESG actually has nothing to do with morality. ESG doesn't mean any investment is actually screened out or avoided on the basis of ethics. You can look at it simply as a framework to identify either risks or opportunities relating to the impact of these non-financial factors on a company, and then insert those assessments into the company valuation to assess whether or not you want to buy shares or make that investment. Oh, the, next, um, the next segment of responsible invest, investing is ethical investing which effectively involves something called negative screening. This is identifying and avoiding certain themes or categories that investors may find offensive or unethical. Tobacco, mining, deforestation, animal cruelty are all examples of sectors or themes that may be screened out of an ethical portfolio's investment universe. Once an investor or an investment manager has defined its ethical investment framework, you'll then pick and choose from universe of possible investments that meet the criteria of avoiding 
allocating investments to companies that engage in these market activities. Having a robust and comprehensive negative screen framework, so, so well-defined companies that you don't or sectors that you won't invest in, provides investors with comfort that their money is not being allocated to areas that are not aligned to their personal morals or value, values. Effectively, it's about in, avoiding investments that are deemed to do harm. So we've touched on negative screen, screening, um, removing companies that you don't want to invest in. Impact investing involves positive screening coupled with an objective for financial returns and is next in line on the responsible investment spectrum, one behind philanthropy, which invests for impact alone. So if negative screening is about removing companies that are deemed to do harm, Positive screening is about actively seeking out and investing companies that produce goods or services that contribute to solving predefined sustainability challenges. In other words, doing good, not just avoiding doing bad. And this is where the term impact comes from. The world is facing a number of long-term challenges at the moment. Um, sustainability challenges such as clean energy, water management, environmental services, health, education, sustainable transport, these are all areas where we could benefit from a global shift in the right direction. And an allocation of capital to these sectors should not only contribute to the progression of these sustainability solutions, but also benefit from the sector tailwinds that are likely to be present due to the fact that the world needs these goods and services more and more as we transition to a sustainable future. Going back to ethical investing, which avoids certain industries that may not align with investor values. Here are some examples of areas that may be screened out or negatively screened is the term for, from an ethical portfolio of investments. But as I mentioned earlier, everyone's ethics are different. Even some sectors that may seem bad simply because the Bible said so, and some people may think are harmless, when you actually get into it, are the catalysts for some very serious social and environmental issues that humankind faces. Production of pornography, for example, is linked to sex trafficking, sexual exploitation, and modern day slavery worldwide. For children and young people, pornography is linked to unrealistic attitudes about sex and less progressive views of gender roles. Alcohol, as another example, can have serious negative health, legal, and social consequences. Sure, most people, uh, like myself, enjoy a beer or two at the pub on a Friday night, but when it becomes a problem, excessive alcohol consumption affects productivity, increases pressures on relationships and finances, and plays a large role in domestic violence. Alcohol consumption accounts for almost 10% of deaths worldwide among 15 to 49 year olds. Do you want to be supporting an industry like that with your money? Well, that's a question that only you can answer. Another area that's often included in ethical screens is gambling. Problem gambling can lead to severe negative financial, emotional, and social outcomes, not just for the gambler, but for their families as well. It has a high social financial cost due to mental health issues arising from addiction, lower work productivity or job losses, relationship breakdowns, and even crime. And you can see on this slide a list of other sectors that investors may choose to avoid putting their money to. This list specifically makes up the sectors that we screen out as part of our ethical investments framework here at Pangana. But as I said before, everybody's ethics, morals, and values are different. Okay, so just to finish up on these different styles of responsible investing, let's look at some practical examples to try and make it a bit more clear. In the left-hand column here, we have the kind of companies that are likely to be excluded by negatively screened, by negative screens, so removed from making any investment in an ethical portfolio. In many instances, these companies have negative externalities. And what I mean by that is the use of their products has negative effects for society or the environment. So an ethically labeled fund wouldn't or shouldn't invest in any of these types of companies. As I mentioned earlier, depending on the ethical framework applied and what screens an investor uses, 
These companies typically make up about 20% of the public markets or of listed companies on stock exchanges around the world. In the middle, we have companies which are included in most ESG funds. Remember I said earlier, this is less to do with ethics, but more to do with assessing non-financial factors as a way of determining risks and opportunities associated with these companies. They're not necessarily contributing positive outcomes, but are they good corporate citizens? I guess the question to ask is, are they trying to be the best versions of themselves? And it's a good example why even though a company may check all the boxes for an ESG strategy, many still won't meet the criteria for some more strictly managed ethical or impact funds. Toyota and Unilever may be taking all the right steps to be good corporate citizens, using renewable or sustainably sourced materials, be well represented by a diverse board of directors, etc. But at the end of the day, Toyota still produces products which create carbon emissions, and Unilever still produces chocolate desserts, which certainly doesn't go towards contributing to solving the social obesity issues. Again, this is where each investor needs to decide on their own moral compass and often may choose to invest in funds or products that integrate a combination of these different responsible investment approaches. On the right, we have the truly impactful companies, also representing about 20% of the listed equity universe. And these are companies that we invest in through our Web Sustainable Impact Fund. Um, but given the audience here today with Superhero, it's not a fund available through the ASX, so probably a conversation for another day. But in short, these companies grow in lockstep with better social or environmental outcomes. Examples on the slide that I've used are TPR, who produce blades for wind turbines, Aptiv, which makes components for electric vehicles, and Arcadis, which is an architectural and engineering consultancy that focus on, focuses on preparing buildings and infrastructure for climate change. We recently published a piece on our website entitled ESG, Sometimes the Journey is More Rewarding Than the Destination. And I thought it would be worth quickly mentioning it here as perhaps it's an interesting approach that some investors can take when looking to invest on the ESG side of things and finding those good corporate citizens. And it will become more relevant as the, as the presentation today goes on. But in essence, with all of the fuss and focus on ESG today, the market tends to place a high valuation on ESG leaders while undervaluing companies that are in the process of actively improving their ESG footprint. Finding differences in price between, or between, between price and value is widely accepted as a cornerstone of an effective investment strategy. And investing in businesses that are committed to improving their ESG footprint can reduce the risk of overpaying for a shareholding that is already an ESG leader. Another way to look at it is that it may be better to travel than to arrive when it comes to ESG investing. And by doing so, reducing the valuation risk associated with integrating ESG factors into your portfolio. So hopefully that gives you um, a, a broad understanding and a bit more about responsible and, and ethical investing. Let's take a look at the growing demand for responsible investments. Uh, we can look at the challenges with investing responsibly and some of the structures and approaches that can be used when choosing an ethical investment that may suit your needs. This slide here shows the results of a survey conducted by the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, or RIAA as it is known. And importantly, RIAA surveyed the clients, not the financial advisors of those clients, but the clients themselves, and found that the vast majority of investors now expect their investments to be invested ethically and, responsible, and responsibly. And the fund flows completely back up this consumer sentiment. 40% of all professionally managed assets in Australia are now managed according to some level of ethical or responsible framework. And 71% of all assets in super incorporate ESG. Now, what that means will obviously vary, and there's a whole bunch of other considerations, but it's clear that people are voting with their savings. So what are some of the challenges of ethical investing? 
The first one, as I've touched on quite a bit already, is that there's no universal framework for what makes an ethical investment portfolio ethical. Yes, there's a number of thought leaders that have emerged. Um, the UNPRR principles are an example, but this issue is made quite complex by the very fact that, as I've said, we as humans all have different codes of ethical and moral values, which will ultimately determine where we do or do not want to put our money. Limited and underdeveloped reporting for ethical funds is another one. I'll touch on some examples of what this means when we look at the choosing an ethical investment slide that's coming up. But ultimately, with no standard framework for what defines an ethical investment or on how companies or investment managers are to report on what they're investing in, it can be very difficult for everyday investors to compare apples with apples. And that brings us to probably the biggest challenge that everyday investors can face when choosing an ethical investment, and that's greenwashing. By its simplest definition, greenwashing is false labeling, a form of dishonest marketing used to persuade the public that an organization's product or policies are more environmentally friendly than they actually are. When what's in the box doesn't quite match up with what's on the box, that's greenwashing. As consumers, it's very easy to fall prey to these dishonest practices. As a human, it happens to me as well. In the image on the left, a company doesn't even have to make any specific claims about being environmentally friendly, but through the simple psychology of cover, of sorry, of color, or even the simple addition of a picture of a leaf on the package, we may automatically jump to the conclusion that a product is naturally more ethical than it actually is. And this is where it becomes important for investors, especially when you're allocating your hard-earned money, to ensure that you spend the time to not just take ethical claims at face value and ensure you're investing in a product that does what it says it does on the box. Um, and I'll touch a bit more on that in, in the coming slides. Okay, so now we understand what ethical ESG impacts responsible investing is. We know there's growing demand and yes, there are some challenges to getting it right. So now how about actually putting your money to work? How do we now go about getting invested responsibly and choosing the right products? Given the platform and audience here today with Superhero being a trading platform to access the stock exchange, I'm making the assumption that a lot of people in this call are probably going to hold at least one form of passive ETF in their investment portfolio. Now, for entry-level investors, ETFs offer a nice, simple, easy to understand narrative. They tell a story that people can relate to, and this makes the barrier to entry or the barrier to investing quite low the solar technology ETF, the clean energy ETF, the carbon footprint ETF. These names seemingly tell us exactly what we're investing in and effectively anchoring your investment to a certain index theme in the market and putting it on autopilot, following the movements of these indexes, whichever way they go. It's great when they're going up, not so great when they're going down, but effectively you're able to pick a theme and you're able to attach your, your investment outcomes to that theme. But there's another way to get invested by the stock exchange to an actively managed portfolio of considered investments via the structure of a listed investment company. Being from Pengana Capital and the fact that we, you know, full disclaimer, we offer a listed investment company. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of active management and why we think it's particularly relevant in terms of an ethical or responsible investment portfolio. Um, but as I've said, everybody needs a difference and, you know, you need to make the right decision for what works for you. But this active management approach is very appropriate to responsible investing, especially when it comes to dealing with all the nuances of the space and ensuring that it's done right. So let's look at some of the characteristics of an actively managed listed investment company that make it an applicable solution for this kind of investing. And then I'll go into giving one or two examples. The first is access to a professional active investment team. Rather than simply running on autopilots and blindly following market moves, 
having access to a professional investment team can bring a number of benefits. One of those benefits, at least when you're assessing your investment options, may be the presence of a long-term track record. ETF popularity has picked up in recent years, especially with the rise of retail or mom and pop investors. But this means that most ETFs are quite new and have quite a short track record, many not even going back more than five years. And given that we've just gone through a long bull market, a lot of these strategies have never really been tested through market cycles. Rachel mentioned at the beginning, you know, past performance is not a guaranteed indicator of future performance. Um, it's in the disclaimer, but at the same time, I think products that have been around for longer periods of time have had their investment approaches tested and possibly refined across a wider range of market environments. Next is the presence of a considered and actively managed set of frameworks. Whether it's an ethical framework or an underlying investment framework, actively managed investments can and should be about more than just an initial set of box checking, which doesn't always apply to every single company. It's especially important when it comes to ESG analysis um, due to an often lacking set of immediately available data that can be extracted from these companies. And there's a certain level of human subjectivity and qualitative analysis that needs to be undertaken by investment analysts when looking at ESG or even negative screening because as we discussed, there's no universally defined framework or agreed metrics on this. And a truly effective strategy needs a human element involved. The concept that I spoke about earlier of finding ESG improvers um, in, in the earlier slide is another factor that cannot be built into a passive strategy. It requires particular analysis into company data, possibly even on a daily basis in order to identify those ESG improvers. And so with a passively allocated portfolio, as is the case with many ETFs, it's a model that automatically buys and sells shares indiscriminately without any oversight. And this causes issues when investors try to screen for things like company controversies, and particularly in regard to how often company data is updated, which is typically only reported in an annual report, which is where most ETF data would come from. So a passive filter is subject to limited data that companies are reporting on annually, and it's always backward looking, whereas an active investment team would be constant looking at company data points and then adjusting positions and allocations as required based on a specific investment framework that has been formulated. I said I'd give a, a practical example, which, which may make this a, a little bit clearer. And I think the best way to illustrate this active versus passive point is through, um, is through a real world example. So firstly, if it's done well, responsible investing and particularly sustainable investing is very nuanced. And it often is difficult to capture the nuance simply with a set of predetermined rules. For example, one of the themes that's popular and rightly popular at the moment um, in ethical portfolios is to allocate to low carbon investments. These companies that you see here on the slide can be found in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Banks, gaming businesses, software businesses, digital platforms, all have lower carbon footprints, um, but for many reason, a lot of these businesses wouldn't be welcome addition to actively manage responsible portfolios. The other very important consideration is what you see when you look under the hood. This obviously isn't unique to the Dow Jones, and so I'm not particularly picking on, on this index, but a look at some of the companies in their sustainability index is a great example of what I'm talking about. Some investors that invest in products that passively track the sustainability index may actually be surprised to see some of the companies that they are invested in. Once again, it's important to really understand what you are investing in and where you are putting your hard-earned money. All right, we are entering the home straight now. So how can we go about choosing the right investment? The first thing you could do is look at a product's investment criteria, where on the responsible spectrum that I spoke about earlier do they fit? And does this align with your own moral compass and the types of companies that you want to be invested in? 
Next, and this is widely accepted, a widely accepted principle of risk mitigation and investing is diversification in line with your own risk profile. Typically an investment product that is highly concentrated into a smaller number of investments may have the potential for higher volatility as each investment's performance will have a greater impact or influence on the performance of the portfolio as a whole. Whereas a product that is diversified across a larger number of investments, uh, sectors, geographies, or even market caps may have the potential to offer lower levels of, of volatility as the correlation of performance across its investments is likely to be lower over time. Again, it can help to invest with a reputable manager that has a strong track record, um, not only in the sense of investment performance, but shareholder engagement, reporting, and general reputability. Industry certifications can also provide an additional level of comfort. Um, there are a number of independent third party bodies that have been set up to assist investors in finding true to label products, such as the RIAA here in Australia that I mentioned earlier, uh, who ran that survey, and the P and PRI globally. And finally, you can learn a lot um, by looking at what sort of reporting and disclosure an investment manager makes on their portfolio and investment activities. Examples of some of the reporting we provide shareholders is a published ESG policy, clearly defined position statements, voting reports, um, and an available and constantly updated holdings list of all investments in the portfolio. This is an educational presentation, so I won't spend too much time on product specifics for one of the products we have at Pingana, but I do think it would be valuable to provide a quick overview, um, which will give you an idea of how some of these things we've spoken about today accumulate into a real world investment product. So Pingana International Equities Limited, or PIA as the stock code, as is the stock code on the ASX, is Australia's largest international ethical listed investment company and aims to provide a robust capital growth as well as a steady stream of fully franked quarterly paid dividends to our shareholders. The company has about $310 million under management as was the number at close of, of market yesterday. And the investment portfolio is run by a highly regarded US-based institutional grade active investment manager called Harding Lovner, who at their firm across global equities have a track record of market outperformance going back over 32 years. And who follow the mantra that investing in high quality, ethically screened growing businesses at reasonable prices leads to superior risk adjusted returns over the long term. The quality, ingress, uh, quality growth investment framework that they use has been set up for picking its investments and means that all companies must meet four criteria in order to be considered for inclusion in the portfolio, which typically holds anywhere from 35 to 75 different stocks at any given point in time. These four criteria, as you can see on your screen, are a competitive advantage, a sustainable longer term growth path, financial strength, strength in the balance sheet, and a quality management team in place running the business with a good track record, a clear strategy, and a consistent regard for shareholders. This investment framework, which already incorporates ESG analysis, is then overlaid with a comprehensive ethical framework, which you can see on the right-hand side. PIA has had this framework in place all the way since back in 2004. So I guess you could say we were ethical before it was cool. And in 2017, we went out and did a stakeholder engagement campaign to ensure that the company's ethical screens were still relevant and met the expectations of investors, research houses, financial planners, and made a few updates and refinements in line with the findings and feedback from our shareholders. As the whole space matures, expectations of investors change and it's important to evolve. The other thing that makes the structure quite unique in the market, and I won't go into detail because it's a whole different webinar on its own, is that because of the company structure employed by PIA, we're one of the very few vehicles that is able to generate fully frank Australian dividends for our shareholders, while also offering a portfolio, a portfolio of international investments. 
So in concluding, in conclusion, excuse me, um, responsible investing offers a way to deeper connect with your savings. You should consider your own moral compass in order to determine how you would like your money to be allocated. It's good to know and understand what your chosen product is investing in. And you could consider an active manager to truly achieve these responsible investment outcomes. I feel like I've been talking to myself for quite some time now. Hopefully that, that made some sense, Rachel, but um, you know, and, and hopefully that gave a, a, good, a good idea and good example of some of these concepts of responsible investing that we speak about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dean, for that. That was very comprehensive and I got a lot out of that and I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, we do have a few minutes for some Q&A now. I've got a couple of questions that came through before and through the webinar. Um, and then if anyone else has any questions, feel free to pop those in the Q&A function now and we'll go through them. Any that we don't go through, I'll make sure they get back to you on email. Um, or you can go to our website um, and we've got live chat there um, for our team in Sydney, we'll, we'll be able to help you. Um, so we've got a question from James, Dean, you showed a number of different industries there on your screen, um, that were, you know, potentially things can be negatively screened. Um, now that list there, that against, or is that more of an overall industry standard? I think you covered this, but it would be good just to re reiterate on that one. Yeah, so our ethical investment framework um, that we employ across a number of our responsible investment strategies um, across the firm uh, is, is, a, is a very robust framework. We've developed it in conjunction with the Ethics Center and Sustainalytics. Those specific negative screens that I showed on that slide are specific to our, uh, our products. We feel they are very extensive. Um, as I said, we've got our ESG policies and frameworks um, fully reported on our website under reports and resources. And so those, those headlines are obviously what we show in, uh, you know, in the presentation. But if you want to read more in terms of the nuances on each of those, you, you can get into to the weeds. Um, as I said, there's no standard framework. So we've done what we believe is the best and most comprehensive and robust framework. And also based on feedback from our shareholders, we do a lot of shareholder engagement and understanding where you know, our client base, uh, where their moral collective moral compass um, is. And then we'll build, we've built that ethical framework off the back of that. Um, but one, certainly one of the challenges for investors who are looking to invest responsibly is that every product is a little bit different. And so it's almost worth before you go out and, and look to find a product, taking a step back and understanding, you know, what's your moral compass? Where, what are your values? Where do you want to be putting your money? I gave that example earlier about, you know, your friend who comes to you and says they want to start an animal testing laboratory. Well, you know, I have pets. I love my pets, and and uh, I probably wouldn't be rushing at the opportunity, even if it is very commercially viable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in line with that question, we had a question from Finian around um, superheroes features to encourage responsible investing. Um, we do have categories on our invest tab, so I think there's one for ESG leaders, one for climate leaders, and one for renewables. But even within those categories there is a range of different companies that may have different screens. Um, you know, Superhero is, is a platform that allows you to invest in shares, but we are not an investment manager in the sense that we are not defining these screens for you um, and we're not going to tell you what your own values are. So, Dean, like you said, it's important to write down the things that you absolutely don't want to invest in. You've given us today a range of, of categories that people might want to look at. Um, some may be important to people and some may not be so important. Um, and then really just going out and doing your research on the types of companies, ETFs, licensed investment companies that do or don't um, screen for those things, or, or, you know, going that further step around positive screening. And if you're really wanting to invest in a certain, um, a certain category, for example, um, I know a lot of people do invest in ETFs. Um, Pangana is not an ETF provider, but just to give you an example of two different 
let's say, ethical um, ETFs. If you compare, for example, the BetaShares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF, that ETF has some ESG factors and also negatively screens for some specific um, for some specific industries. You can find all of the information on the provider's website. So that goes for ETFs and LICs as well. Um, but for example, that BetaShares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF, that will not invest in companies that have direct or significant exposure to fossil fuels or deemed inconsistent with responsible investment considerations. So examples of companies in that fund are NVIDIA, Apple, and Visa. Now to compare that to, and you know, again, go in and look at all of the holdings, it's really important. But if we compare that to the VanEck Clean Energy ETF, this is an ETF that actually targets companies involved in clean energy, energy produ production, sorry. Um, so as a bit of a different thing here, and you might not know some of these companies, but they invest in Enphase Energy, Solar Edge Technologies and Brookfield Renewable. So you can see there really the difference in terms of negatively screening and ESG and then moving towards, Dean, like you said, that, that more specific um, industry-based or the positive screening selectment, selection of um, investment. So just an example there. Again, that's not giving you advice to go and invest in these funds. It's really important that you go out, look at all of your options um, and look at the things that are most important to you. Let me get my questions up again. Just give me one second. Um, so Dean, I guess question for you around PIA. Um, how does PIA, we, we did go through it, but how does PIA differ um, from a passive ETF like let's say the BetaShares Global Sustainability ETF? What are some of the main differences for people? Uh, so in terms of specific ETF, um, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, you know, I don't focus too much on ETFs in the market. It's, it's just not where we play. Um, or the active versus passive. Sure, passive. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, certainly one of the primary differences, if it's a passive funds, would be the president of that, the, the presence of that actively managed investment team making the decisions on behalf of the investor. And again, you know, going back to the slide that I had earlier on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, an active manager means conscious decision making on what does and doesn't make it into the portfolio rather than just tracking an index and assuming that that's you know, that's hitting all your targets or, or, or all your all your framework. So um, in terms of specific ETFs, I'm sure one of the guys on our distribution team would be able to point out any specific differences to, to a chosen ETF. Um, and after the yeah. webinar, you know, I'd be happy to put something together for, for whoever asked that question and send it on. But um, I think primarily the difference is in the nuance of, you know, of responsible investing and in that, you know, you can't just take a predetermined checklist of boxes and say that that checklist of boxes applies to every company, no matter what they do, what sector they're in, what geography they're in. Um, it is all very different. And so if you've got this very defined fr ethical framework that is applied to your, your investment portfolio, um, having that, uh, you know, having that subjective human element that can go and do that qualitative analysis for you um, really, you know, gives you some certainty that you are, that you're achieving your targets. And, and you know, as I said, what's, what's in the box it matches what's on the box. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if people do want to know more about Pangana, Dean, what kind of reporting do you, I guess, have available in terms of your funds um, and where can people find that inf information? Sure. So um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have extensive reporting, you know, portfolio holdings, um, engagement policies, voting registers, all that sort of stuff. We have a range of responsible funds, um, both in the sustainable impact or positive screening, as well as ethical, so negative screening um, and, and some others and some others in between. 
each of those funds, you know, all the information is up and really publicly available on pangana.com. Um, you can either go from memory to the About Us section on our website, and there is a specific responsible investment, uh, you know, option that will take you to our responsible funds. Um, or otherwise, even even our non responsibly marked, just plain unit trust investment funds um, would all have their own, you know, ESG framework in place in terms of of how we would look at and assess the non-financial factors of companies. Yeah, absolutely. So there's differences not only between investment managers, but also within the funds themselves. So it's important to actually look at the product that you're wanting to invest in um, and exactly what that what that holds and what that invests in and the, and the strategy around that as well. Absolutely. I, I think another point which, uh, you know, is probably relevant. So we, a large part of our client base is retail investors, um, but a lot of that segment is either high net worth or advised retail investors, self-managed super funds um, and family offices. And so it does mean that our compliance, our reporting, our disclosures do really have to meet you know, strict, um, you know, best of breed standards to make sure that all the research houses that look at our funds and, and all the different um, independent, like the RIA that I, that I mentioned, um, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure we make all that, that information available for investors. Yeah, the, the RIA, what, what does that stand for, Dean, just for people that might want to go the, and have a look into that? Responsible a Investment Association of Australia. Yep. And they, they've got a great website, which, which is a great starting point for anybody getting started on the, the responsible investment journey. Absolutely. Great. I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, let everyone get back um, to their day. But thank you so much for that, Dean. That was really, really valuable content. Um, and for anyone that wasn't able to join us, we'll have this recording up on YouTube very shortly for you. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you for having me.